Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about performance optimization. <clears throat> My name is Scott Anderson, and I live in Port Douglas in North Queensland, and I work for Technocrat. And what we're going to look at today is rather than bore you with 30 slides of technical details uh, and instructions, what, I'm, what we're going to do is tell a story. So this story is about a project that I worked on for adares.com.au. So some of you may be familiar with adares. They have Shop, they have stores in a lot of shopping centers. They sell bedding, sheets, quilts, lots of exciting things like that. Uh, and they have an a e-commerce site, which happens to get quite a lot of traffic during sales. So what I hope we can get out of today's session <coughs> is to know what to do when you've done all the right things performance-wise and your site is still running slow. That's what we, what we found with this particular uh, project, is all the normal things that you you know to do for, to get your site running fast. We did those, and it was still terrible. So what do you do next? We're going to look at some tests we can use for diagnosing performance issues. We're going to look, uh, we'll look at some tips for analyzing test results. A lot of the tests you do when you do this kind of work uh, spit out tons of data. And so it can be very tedious getting all, like looking through it and trking to find actually what you need to find. So we'll look at some ideas for that and some tools that can assist us in testing, analyzing, and debugging our site. So this is a Drupal Commerce uh, D7 website which we inherited. And on the outside it looks pretty nice. And you wouldn't know that there were major issues with it. On the inside, it had some scary problems. When, when we first got it, there were a lot of bugs. Uh, which we had to work through, and serious ones that caused you know, incorrect prices to be charged and things like that, which was obviously not good. Um, but once even those were resolved, there were some significant performance issues, and the performance problems were most notable during these triple discount sales. So these sales happen twice a year. Um, they happen for a period of about two to three days, and they start at 4 p.m. on the first day. And at that time, uh, over a 1,000 concurrent users converge on the site at the same time. The traffic ramps up really quick and people are desperate to get massive discounts on their sheets start checking out as fast as they possibly can. So we'll, we'll look at it in more detail in a minute, but um, just quickly, the, the site overall was quite fast because we had varnish cash on the front, so a lot of the pages would, would load quickly, but what happens is if you try to add an item to the cart or you hit the checkout page, uh, then that would load really slow uh, during these sales in particular. So in preparation for these sales, <coughs> the, we did all the normal things that, that you do when you're trying to get a Drupal site to run fast. We set up varnish cache on the front, and we configured it so that even after they added an item to the cart and now they have a session, um, we still we would still would strip out the session cookie from the uh, request and return to, uh, to them the static cache varnish page, and then we'd load the uh, cart little counter in the top corner by Ajax. So that was the personalised little piece of content, and then the rest of the pages were still getting returned by varnish. So that's all the product pages and category pages. So that was important because that took 90% of the requests away from the web servers and returned from the varnish servers. We also set up memcache, which handles all the Drupal's caching needs, and we set up Redis, which is similar, but we use, it, we use that just for the sessions and for the form cache. We also migrated the site to an AWS environment, and I'll show you a diagram in a minute. Uh, it was an auto-scaling AWS environment, so it would, when you hit a certain threshold, the web servers would auto-scale, and, and uh, you know, fresh images were created, and it could, it could grow, theoretically, as large as it needed to, to handle the traffic. Um, it all, we also had the ability to scale up because we knew these sales were coming. So you could, we run, had a Jenkins task that would run and it would increase the size of all the, the uh, AWS services. So RDS is, a, is the AWS MySQL database. <coughs> so you could scale up before the event and, and what we were doing was scaling up to the largest RDS database that AWS provides. So during the uh, sale in October 2015, Despite all this uh, preparation, we still managed to crash the database, the largest one that AWS has. And during the peak traffic periods, New Relic was showing server response times of 15 to 18 seconds. So the site was still loading fast on the product pages. As soon as somebody went to the checkout, 
to complete their order, you hit, hit the checkout button, and then at least 15 seconds later, the page would load, which is obviously not ideal. So this is a diagram of the AWS infrastructure. At the top is uh, Squixer, which is a CDN cache, so that's returning all your static assets. Uh, then a load balancer, then Varnish servers, and then another load ba balancer, and then the web server layer, uh, and that was auto scale. So during the large sale, sales, we actually got up to 100 web servers running, um, which is actually an indication of very poor code, not, not <laughs> traffic. And um, there's a solar service that ran about those, and then on the left there you can see there's an RDS database and, Elastica, and two Elasticash servers which are running Memcache and Redis. Um, and so that RDS database, being the largest one available, it has 244 gigs of memory and 32 virtual CPUs. So what this proves to us is that you can have the most amazing and powerful environment um, available, and if your code is rubbish, then you can still crash the site. So we have to diagnose the problem. Um, obviously, we couldn't fix this during the sale because it's not enough time. So the, the task we came after that, okay, now what do we do? We've, we've set up everything. You know, Vine is working as well as it possibly can. Um, we can't possibly scale up the environment anymore, um, or, you know, running on, on a lamp stack or we're running into next but, um, And so we have to actually dig down into the site to see what's going on. And basically, it, it reminds me of the medical field, is what we have to do is run a series of tests and then look at the test results and see um, why is this patient so sick. <coughs> so test one is an easy test to run. Um, you've probably done it before. Uh, you can use user develop module uh, and the memcache module and just turn on your logs. So turn on SQL log and query log and the memcache log and all that will do is spit out tons of SQL que queries and memcache requests um, on the bottom of every page. And so you can see for a particular page, uh, every single query that goes, goes to the database and every single request that goes to Memcache. Now, as I said before, you get a ton of data. There's you know, hundreds and hundreds of queries and hundreds of Memcache requests. Uh, and so looking through all that can be really tedious. So we're going to look at you know, what do we actually look for in that data so we can identify a problem. So one thing to look for is too many requests for the same thing. Uh, yeah, if it's, if it's loading the same entity or whatever it is, the same item over and over again, then that's probably not a good idea. There might be some custom code in there that's doing the wrong thing and not, easy, and not caching where it could, for example. Um, you want to look for requests that, for things that we don't need on this page. And we found a couple of cases where that, that was true, but if you shouldn't be loading you know, something that's completely irrelevant to the page you're on. And you, if it is, you need to find out why. Uh, we want to look for database queries for items that should be, in, uh, should be cached. So, um, if, if this isn't a cold cache uh, request, like if you've already got your caches warmed up, then what you want to make sure is that everything that should be um, in getting cached is, and you don't want to see any database queries that are going, for, um, for example, for a product um, in information, product, product entity, because that should have already been cached. Um, and we also want to look for unnecessary updates to cache items. So are we seeing uh, cache sets um, on page refreshes. So, you, you, like the caches have already been set, but we're seeing, seeing them happen again and again, and for some reason not get um, used. So, this is the first problem we came across, and look, this was uh, on, on loading the checkout page, uh, scrolling through the massive list of SQL query queries, and you might not be able to see that query, you should, okay? Um, we came across this one, which looks suspicious, and if you look at what it's doing, it's uh, selecting from field data commerce coupon code uh, where entity ID is in, and then there's a very long list of entity IDs. Uh, I'm just going to switch no, no, no. and show you what it actually looked like. Here's the checkout page. Um, here's a SQL query log. Tons of queries, but when we get down further, and we actually see these. Really ugly ones. Back out there. Now, you probably won't be able to see, but there are 2,141 uh, entity IDs in there, which happens to correspond to the number of coupon codes in the database. 
So the question was, why are we loading every single coupon code on the first load of the checkout page? Because the, at, that's the pay, uh, at that point, no coupons are even entered or anything. So this falls into the category of loading data that we don't need. <coughs> um, not only that, it's not just one query. There are multiple que queries. And it goes for a very, very long time. You can scroll. But anyway, I'm going to keep scrolling because we'll take the rest of the session. So, I was excited when I saw that because I thought, okay, this is it. We fixed it. <laughs> um, so, how do we fix that? Well, uh, fortunately, I was able to search on Drupal.org and found a patch for the coupon module that prevented coupons loading, every coupon loading on every, on every page or every checkout page. Uh, obviously, it's not a major issue if you only have a few coupons, like if you're just loading five coupons, and no, you wouldn't even notice. But because of the size of the site and the number of coupons, and, uh, and some other factors which we'll see later, uh, it was causing some major issues. So that was an easy patch. As soon as we patched that, that problem went away. Um, the only reason that hadn't been done earlier is because there was custom code in the site that relied on that particular version of Commerce Coupon uh, to, to work. So it would have been updated earlier had that custom code not uh, relied on that. Okay, test two. So at that point I thought, okay, we're winning and um, my job is almost done. So I thought, now I'm going to do some load tests and prove that it's all good now. Um, so to do the load tests, I use JMeter scripts to try and replicate real life transactions. Uh, so just basically add a product to the cart, go to the checkout page and complete the checkout process. <coughs> Uh, use a service called redline13.com. If you've never seen that and you want to do load testing, I highly recommend it. It's um, on, the, on the front page, it says almost free load testing, and, and it is. So all you need to, do, to use it is uh, your own AWS account. You plug your AWS credentials into it, and you can load JMeter scripts. And what it will do is ask you um, how many EC2 instances do you want to spin up, what size, what regions. And then it just runs the scripts for you, and at the end of it, that gives you real-time results, and then at the end it gives you some pretty charts and things. Um, but yeah, very useful for load testing and not expensive at all. Because in the end, probably ran 300 load tests by the time we finished this project. Um, and so, obviously when you're running load tests like that, you can't, um, you can't use a SQL query log, and you can't um, debug, you know, you use xdebug to step through the code while, while load test is running. So you need some way of looking at what's happening on the inside during the load test. So for that we use New Relic, and I'll show in a, in a second how, how you can use that. Um, but that is super useful for being able to identify what's happening during a load test that's causing things to run slowly. So what we're looking for are slow requests and transactions, and slow function calls within a transaction. So just quickly switch to um, New Relic, and this is for a different site, but we'll look at that on this slide. So what, what happens is you load test, and you'll be able to see on your New Relic chart um, where the load test starts and ends, and so you have this period of probably in, um, increased response time. So what you want to do is, is highlight that period so that you're only looking at the data within that. that work? Um, so you highlight the, the period of time you need and then click on transactions and then on the right hand side you'll get a list of the requ requests that took the longest period of time. So find you know, the worst ones or the ones that are occurring the most and you can click on that particular request and then it will load details from that request and it takes a second, there we go, and it tells you what took the longest time, which particular function, a little pretty chart, but the most useful thing I found was this trace details. So this breaks down all the function calls how long each function took to run, and then it highlights some of the ones that ran slowly. Uh, and that's super useful. Once you have that, you can figure out where the slow point is, and you can start to investigate in your code why it's, it's slow at that point. So that's the way we ran these tests, and this is what we found. So this is a screenshot, a screenshot from the trace details page, and what you can see here is we're trying to load an entity, so we've got an entity load, comes down all through these caching um, functions, and then it gets a memcache, and it does a memcache get, and then there's a lock wait, and I'll explain about that in a minute. So it's 
it's, um, yeah, there's a lock there, that, so it waits for five seconds. You can see on the left the uh, yellow orange color, and it's out in place five seconds. Then it finishes the lock, the lock wait, and it tries to get again, and now it's lock waiting again. And then it tries again, and then there's another lock. So by the, by the time you get to the bottom of the screen, it's waited 15 seconds, uh, and this is one request. Um, and then after that, it continues on. So I'll explain about what lock weight is. So if, if some of you may be familiar with um, stampede protection. What that is, is um, when, you have, you, when you use memcache, you can turn stampede protection on it. What it does is like, a request comes in for a particular um, cache item, and when it's not there, so it's a miss, uh, it creates a lock. That request create, creates a lock for that item. And then it goes away to populate the item, and any other requests that come in in the meantime just have to wait because they say, okay, someone's already populating this, you can wait until we've populated it. And then once it populates it, it releases the lock and everyone gets a fresh cache data. That's what stampede protection does. And uh, when it works, it, it's very useful. Um, so you can sort of see the logic of it in this diagram. So what we were seeing in that trace is a request came in for a particular entity and stampede protection is on, so it goes into that lock wait phase. But what happens is, is that by the default settings, it waits for five seconds and it tries that three times. And so it'd wait for five seconds, now there's still lock here. So wait for another five seconds, now there's still lock, wait for another five seconds. Okay, and then it gives up and returns false. It was, it was a miss. So the question we had to ask was, why are these locks not getting released? So what's creating the locks and then causing them to, um, not to be released? So after running a, um, looking at a lot of the new relic data, what we were able to find was that the most common cause was actually coming from a, um, loading a taxonomy channel. And so I had to use you know, Xdebug and go through line by line to figure out what was happening. But what happened was there was a particular taxonomy term that had been deleted at some stage, but it was still being referenced in the menu somewhere. So the code was trying to load it on every page. So what happens is it, uh, it requests to load this taxonomy term, and it goes to the cache, and it's a miss. So then it acquires a lock, because I'm going to populate this from the database. And then it goes to the database, and it's not there either. So it's another miss. And instead of releasing the lock, it just says, oh, no, there's nothing here. But if, because it forgot to release, release the lock, all the other requests that have come in the meantime are now waiting for 15 seconds because of the, there's a lock on that item. Um, so the fix for that was just a few lines of code to say, OK, if, if you acquired a lock and now there's a database miss, then release the lock anyway. So at least all the other requests can see that there's nothing there. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, so the yeah, fix for that was in the end five lines of code, and um, that made another massive difference. And if you can think about the impact of, of that um, mechanism, yes? It hasn't yet, and I'm, I'm going to post, yes, I'm going to post a, 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 a thread about it. And I'm, I'm just curious because we were using the particular version of it. It's in the Entity Cache module. The particular version we were using wasn't the latest. I actually went to the latest to see if that resolved the problem, and it did. But the code was quite different and caused some other issues. So I went back to the version we had and fixed that. Uh, but I'll, I'm going to post it anyway because it might be helpful for if someone comes across the same issue. Yeah, okay, so that, that fixed a lot of problems. Next test. Okay, so this is... Um, this one was actually using the memcache log, so we're looking at all the requests um, that were going to memcache to, re to retrieve cache items. And uh, after we saw what was happening, I uh, we'll had to use uh, PHP Storm and Xdebug to actually figure out why. So this particular one, this is the same tips as before, but what we're actually looking for here is requests for things that we don't need on this page. So this is a snapshot of, of the memcache request log. And what you can see there is we're returning these uh, ctools export views data. And on the right-hand side, all these different views, commerce cart, wish list, commerce orders. And you can't see the full list there, but there's actually a really large list. And what that list represented was every single view in the website. So every single one of the views was going And so this uh, log was appearing on every single page that we navigated to. So on every single page, we were reloading the uh, default settings for every view in the website. And if you think about the combination of something like this with the previous issue where we had like lock issues, so requests getting locked up, um, it was just obviously disastrous for performance. Now, why was this happening? So that was where Xdebug came in. 
what happens is the seesaw's cache um, loads on its first load, loads um, a cache version of the default settings for every view, and then it's just sitting there in cache. And then when you, if you want to load a particular view for the page, it goes to that cache and says, I already know this much about it, this view, and then it gets more data than it needs. But what was happening was um, there was a particular menu view, so it's, it's, so it's on every page, and this menu view, when it tried, when CTools um, tried to get it from its, its cache, um, it was never there. So then it would say, okay, well, if, if this view isn't in cache, we'll, we'll um, refill the whole cache and we'll get all the views that we need. And it would refill the whole cache, but it wasn't um, getting that particular view and putting it in the cache. And the reason it wasn't is because that view was in code, but, I'm oh, sorry, in database, but not in code. So you don't know about that. So it was defined in the database, but it wasn't in code anywhere, it wasn't in a module, and it wasn't in features or anything like that. And for whatever reason, CTools was, a, was not storing it in its cache just because it was, it was a database only view. So the solution for this one was just to export this view to a feature, and just the fact that it was in a feature meant that it was in code, and now CTools was happy to cache it every time, and that prevented um, reloading every, the default settings for every view on every page. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so the next triple discount sale. So after all this, lots of load testing we've done, um, and we've load tested on the production site at one in the morning on one day, swapping out the production database with a backup, and we were confident that it was handling it well. Um, one thing I learned from that, though, is that when we tried to send about 2,000 users simultaneously to the site, we crashed the load testing service. Um, so you need more easy to instances for that. <coughs> but yeah, I was confident it was going well, but you can never tell 100% until we get real life traffic um, how it's going to respond. So the next triple discount sale uh, started, and I was sitting in front of the computer with New Relic open, and you can, just watching the chart, because you got the trip response time. So the, the, you know, the resting heart rate of the response time was like 300 milliseconds. So I was just watching that and see what's going to happen. And it was getting close to 4 o'clock when the sale was going to start. So the sale hits, and uh, one of our other developers sends me this um, Google Analytics shot, 1,600 people on the site. And this is what I'm watching. So you can see on, on the bottom right is the throughput. And that's the 4 o'clock sale. And you can see the traffic increasing significantly. Um, and what, what you see in the main chart here is the server response time. So a very slight increase, but in the end we're still only doing about 300 milliseconds. If, if you could have seen, I never got a screenshot, but if you could have seen that um, server response time for the previous sales, at that point, at 4 o'clock, it would have spiked to 15,000 milliseconds. So that was a very uh, exciting thing to see there. Big win. <laughs> And this is um, some data that comes out of section.io, which used to be called Squixup. And you can see their median load times for different kinds of pages. So there's category pages at 2.4 seconds, product pages at 2.9 seconds, and then the checkout page at 3.9 seconds. Um, and that's a pretty awesome achievement because all those other pages are varnish cache, and checkout pages got, is of no varnish cache. Um, so that was good, and also the previous sale that had been sitting at about 16 or 17 seconds median load time for the checkout. Um, so that was also very um, heartening to see. Um, a few resources. There's a book, if you haven't seen it, you can get it on buy online, High Performance Drupal. It's a great overview for all the basics for how to get your Drupal site running fast in high, tra tra high traffic environments. Um, but there's plenty of info on JMeter, Redline, and debugging with PHP Storm if you've never done that. And yeah, that's all. Um, any questions? Testing, testing. Sorry, guys. Um, just uh, with the Q and A, um, I'll pass around the mic. Um, so just raise your hands. Uh, I'll bring the mic around and uh, just hold it to your chin. That's great, thanks. Um, how many servers did you need once you've done all the optimization? And did you need like the RDS instance that big? Yeah, 
Put your hand up if you've got a question. Yeah, new relics, great. Did you did you look at the um, performance profile and sex debug and stuff like that? Question. I'm sorry if you've answered this before and I wasn't paying attention. Um, did it uh, add to their bottom to the company's bottom line? Yeah. Appreciate your uh, your efforts there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. some of the C tools caching issue stuff on, on, on yeah, yeah, you should put it on Drupal yeah. because there's probably other people suffering out there. Yeah. That's all. This guy is nice. So you were using uh, Redis and Memcached. What was the reasoning behind this? Yeah, two different things. The main reason is to actually how you can out because the to Yeah. Have you attempted any like, server level optimization, like land step optimization? optimization? Uh, well, <coughs> the, the, this whole session was about showing us how to optimize group uh, application. Have you tried the server level optimization on top of application optimization? Server level. Server level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what we, what we did, 
Sorry, this isn't directly related to um, like caching and, and performance, but you mentioned that um, one of the solutions was to um, push a view to features. I'm wondering, is there like a, a so I guess like from our workflow, we push like local and then bud local into features and push it up to uh, through Git. Is there like a, I guess, a, a reason you weren't doing that initially? Or is there like a, Questions? Alright, that's great. Uh, so please give Scott a big round of applause. And don't forget, uh, all these talks are going to be uh, posted online uh, at the end of the week, or end of next week, sorry, um, on the Drupal South website. So please share these talks with your colleagues uh, and you can use them to review yourself. Thank you.